and this part I'll talk about my post-deployment experiences and my time in until my discharge from the military. So after we got back from Iraq, we got back into you know garrison life, um, which is you know just base life in Fort Bliss, Texas, and I started getting really into nutrition and like changing my diet. I had a book in Iraq. I don't even want to name the title, but you know it's about like party stories kind of and stuff like that. One thing the author of that book mentioned was like talking about paleo eating, rice and price, stuff like that. He started talking about nutrition at one point in the book. Um, you know, he's, he's a bit of an intelligent guy, uh, but you know, 90% of the book is you know uh, junk, I'd say. But that, uh, but that what that valuable 10% uh, definitely had an impact on me in terms of piquing my interest into nutrition. So I looked at Weston Price. I ordered his book, which is called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, and I was, and you know it completely changed my mind. Uh, about the way I saw the world and the way I looked at nutrition and food. Um, one thing interesting about it, so Weston Price is a dentist, and in the 1930s he traveled the world exploring, you'd call like, you know, um, what they call like primitive populations, like uh, unmodernized people or and people who are in the process of being modernized. And he looked at their teeth, of course, and did some like charitable dental work. So like, he went to like the Pacific Islands. He went visited like Native Americans and checked out Native American skulls, and, and he went to parts of Africa, like East Africa, and and uh, the Inuit in you know North America. <clears throat> and he you know looked at their teeth and the health of their teeth and used that as a gauge for the health of their diets. Fascinating book. I highly recommend it. And he found that people who are still eating their traditional diets had like perfect teeth they they very rarely had dental caries you know he'd, he'd look at 500 teeth and he'd find like one dental carry or something they rarely had dental caries or like cavities um they they didn't have any malocclusion either so like when people get braces nowadays because they have crowding of the teeth they didn't have any of that um and he suspected that they had they were eating enough fat soluble vitamins like vitamin a and d and uh, another vitamin he calls vitamin K2, which is an actual vitamin, uh, which works with vitamin A. And he said that they were getting enough of these vitamins and, and, and other nutrients in their diet that um, they didn't have these, that their, their, their jawbone and so on, like their facial bones developed fully. And that, you know, braces and a number of other health complications, which are common in our modern world, um, that they are an effect of like nutrient deficiencies, and so when when people are provided with these proper nutrients, proper diets, these traditional diets, they don't see these. But then when he saw people getting modernized, like civilization had just started to reach them, like a road was built, you know, stuff like that, and they started eating modern foods, these people had the worst health. Because they weren't fully modernized, they didn't have you know full access to healthcare and all these other things. Uh, but they were touched by the modern world, and so they weren't eating fully their traditional diets. They're kind of in the middle, and these people had like the worst health. Uh, a lot of like dental caries, issues like that. Um, you can see their body. You can see like even if in the pictures he took, you can see the differences very clearly. Um, and then he goes to like you know, modern cities and. Back then, nutrition was still a developing science. Uh, after, after World War II is when nutrition really kind of built out. Um, and so, you know, he notices a lot of these health problems, uh, which are even more common than today, you know, uh, mental health and, for example, and, you know, dental health and stuff like that, which are just kind of rampant in the society back then. So very fascinating book. And so I started applying his principles to my life changing my diet and stuff like that. And it also opened my mind to a fascination with uh, these traditional cultures and culture, other cultures in general and, you know, exploration and travel like that. Like he really made me, he gave me a travel bug, you could say. Uh, amazing book, highly recommend it. What's interesting too is that when I was in Iraq, so I was spending so much time sitting at these radios. I was at a night shift as well. My health kind of like, 
uh, even though I was young, my health still kind of, you know, my, my fitness, I would say, dropped quite a bit. And uh, they actually gave us a random physical fitness test. And I actually, the only one I ever failed was that one. And I failed the run. Um, yeah, the, the heat and eating these you know, MREs and stuff, you know, ready to eat meals, you know, all, all that combined really took away my physical endurance and cardiovascular health. Uh, so I failed the run, and back in Garrison, that uh, staff sergeant I was talking about earlier, who uh, you know wasn't the nicest guy. Uh, so well, uh, I'm now working the day and sleeping the night back you know back home, and so he's there every day, and I'm interacting with him, and um, this guy was very uh, annoying to be honest. He's quite he was quite the test. He's quite the test to deal with. Um, apparently, what the cool uh, uh, sergeant first class I had said, what the, the, the excellent one said, um, was that he was like field promoted back in the day. And, you know, the result is that he's kind of like an unqualified leader. And the result is that I guess he just goes around kind of picking on people. Uh, and that's his way of acting like he knows what he's doing. <laughs> uh, and, and so everyone under his rank kind of suffers. And so he became very, uh, he, he was a, a, a source of great frustration for me. Um, like, because I failed that run, he would constantly kind of make fun of me for it and say all these things and, you know, just, just kind of like insult, saying a lot of insulting things and stuff, calling, uh, saying you suck, you know, type of stuff like that. And then uh, we all started doing, you know, uh, fitness training in the morning together, the morning PT, right? And as I started changing my diet, um, I leaned out a bit and I became like pretty good at running. Uh, and I actually got so good at running and I, I was nearly getting 100, uh, which is the maximum score really, on the run. And then I actually started getting hundreds on the run. And this annoying, you know, this, I don't wanna call him annoying, but this difficult staff sergeant then <laughs> started, you'd think that, you know, you're now doing good that he would then be like, oh, hey, good job. You know, you improved really, oh, really quickly. You know, like, what have you been doing? You know, you think you'd act like a normal human being or something, but like rather in instead uh, he starts saying, hey, this guy, like, he must've been faking it. You know, like, there's no way he, you know, f he improved that fast. He must be, he must've been whatever. He's like, he goes to this, the, the cool sergeant first class and he goes, hey, you should give him an article 15 because he improved too fast. He must've been faking it. And I was just like, really? Like, 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 no matter what you ever do, this guy just hates everyone. Like, you know, it's like, I almost wonder if he has like a self-hate or something going on, you know. Um, you know, looking back, I actually kind of feel bad for him, you know, now. I mean, I've been, it's been years since I've seen him or had to deal with him, but whatever makes him act like that, you know, he's living with something his whole life. So really, uh, I hope he gets the help he needs, you know. Um, What's interesting about this though, and this is a very key point. Uh, so he made me so angry over, over you know, the course of a couple of months that, you know, I was sitting at, in my barracks one day and I was like, man, I'm so angry at this guy. I'm about to like, I just want to beat him up and like, you know, I just want to get physical with him, you know? And I went on my computer and I, I think I was looking up like how to deal with anger or something. And uh, I remember reading at some point, you know, this quote like from I don't know, the Bible or, or Buddhism or something that said like holding on to anger is like holding on to a hot coal, hoping you can throw it at someone, you know, waiting to throw at someone. Uh, in the end, you're the only one who gets burned. And I was like, yeah, like I'm letting this guy make me angry, you know? <laughs> and in the end, like I'm just hurting myself. I was like, yeah, I just gotta let it, let it go. And just, just forget about him, you know? I lay down in my bed uh, that night and I was like thinking, I was like, yeah, maybe he acts that way. Maybe, you know, he had some kind of life situation that made him act that way. You know, um, maybe some, you know, he had some kind of trauma growing up and that's what makes him, you know, who he is or whatever. Like, so with regards to, to my interaction with him, you know, just let it go, forgive him, you know, forgiveness, forgiveness. Um, and then, then, like I talked about earlier, that, that suicide bomber as well. I thought about our enemy in Iraq and I was like, you know, these people they also have their own life stories. You know, they have their own ideas that they follow. 
um, their own situations growing up and so on. Um, so like, I can't blame that guy for you know doing his suicide bombing. I can't you know blame all these guys who you know attacked the Iraqis and so on necessarily. Um, I mean, yeah, what they, what they did was like you know objectively pretty wrong, you know, to like uh, attack the Iraqi people and stuff. But uh, at the end of the day, though, I just thought like you know this person is each individual has their own life story that led them down this path. Um, and so, like, in terms of my relationship to them, like, um, you know, just overlook it, forgive it, and move on, you know. Um, it helped to kind of open my mind to interact and, and interactions with different people and not, and overcoming biases, overcoming, you know, Islamophobia, overcoming um, uh, even racism, you know. Um, and then there's two more things uh, in this post deployment. Uh, situation I like to talk about, and then the third, which is probably like one of the most influential. So then we got over time, you know, NCOs kind of rotate through the different units and stuff, and people kind of get kind of refresh things, you know. Eventually, that that staff sergeant who was difficult got moved somewhere else, and I was like, thank God, <laughs> finally, <laughs> you know. And then uh, we got another NCO who was really good, you know. Uh, I call him Staff Sergeant Z, you know, that's what we actually called him. He was, I liked him a lot. He was really good. He was really into infantry stuff, which I was kind of interested in learning more about. And um, and uh, he had these these combat stories, though, which uh, even today I still think back about that he told me those stories, and like they're really fascinating. Um, and they made me think about God. Uh, one of them was he said he was um, when he was like a first time in the army, his first deployment. He was like a private or whatever. He was in uh, somewhere in Iraq, and he was on a rooftop, looking down at you know doing like Overwatch, you know like watching another uh, uh, patrol kind of like move into like a, a city. And he said that this you could he watched this like firefight break out in front of him, or like on his like right or whatever, were like his his guys, and on the left were like the enemy, and generally and people just and they just started shooting at you know the Americans. And he was like, whoa. And it was like very, he's like, it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. You know, he's like, I was like, just kind of like struck by like the action and going on in front of me. You know, it was, it was very exciting. You know, all this shooting going back and forth and stuff. And he could see people moving, you know, and he was just like really attached and like, like, whoa, like surprised and excited. And then, uh, and he didn't realize his own situation because as he's looking around, he looked a little bit to the right and he saw a house and a window. And in that window was an enemy with a uh, like an RPK or an RPD, um, and he was shooting directly at him. And he was like, and he realized he was actually like kneeling on this rooftop. He was actually in the cone of fire of this enemy enemy machine gun. And then he was like, "Whoa, what do I do?" Um, and there's bullets like whizzing past his ears and stuff. And he just like, "What? Oh man!" So he just pushed back from the wall. I realized his NCO was behind him, who had like got behind a. Uh, AC unit or something. He was like Z Z Z, and uh, and he pushed back and got down and like fell down on his back, and he didn't get hit at all. Um, and I was like, wow, you were like in his cone of fire. He's like, yeah, I was in his cone of fire. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, there's another story he had where um, he drove up. He was a, a, a gunner in the turret on a Humvee. And he drove on. They drove onto a street. And they caught like a guy trying to like plant an IED and the guy started running and he just started shooting at this guy. Like he had him lined up perfectly in his sights on his 50 cal and he was shooting at this guy and like this guy went running and he went around a corner under like a, basically just kind of just got away and he ran behind like a building. Um, and then like, he was like, man, like, wow, he had him perfectly lined up in his sights, but he just, just didn't hit him. And, um, and then when he like looked back, he hit like everything else on the street. Like, um, you know, he, like a car was on fire, and like a woman had got hit, and like her arm was like amputated or something, you know. And he was like, "Oh dang!" He didn't even realize all the other stuff that he hit. Like all he saw was that one guy for the moment. Like his vision just tunnel vision, you know. And he was like, "Oh dang!" You know, I'd made a big mistake here. Uh, but again, like what's kind of amazing about that is like these two stories, like you have somebody in the cone of fire of a machine gun and they don't get hit, you know, 
um, even though the person is aiming the machine gun perhaps even basically perfectly, uh, the person just doesn't get hit. You know, um, and I just thought like, dang, well, you know, what are the chances of that? You know, uh, I remember I took AP physics in high school and learning about kinematics. Um, like, so basically trajectory and forces. And I was just thinking about that, you know, like what are the chances of that? And then he told another story. There was, uh, they were clearing a house and his friend went in first and inside the house there was a uh, enemy guy or who knows maybe just an Iraqi or, or somebody with a handgun and he was pointing his gun directly at the guy at this American soldier and he uh, fired at him like point blank in the face and it went in right under his nose and um, he said at the at, for a second everyone thought that he must have been dead you know uh, take a bullet right to the face you know point blank um but he just took a step back and like stumbled back and then you know fired his weapon and you know killed the other guy and afterwards they're looking at him they're like whoa like how do you survive that and he just lost his tooth and his tooth had gone down and, like shattered on his boot or something and um and again i thought with the kinematics behind it i was like wow like what are the chances of that uh rare chance, you know, and it's like when you think about Qadr, again, like the divine decree, like what are the chances of some, you know, what are some chances of surviving this? It's like, it's like God just chooses, God chose who would who would live, who would die, you know, before any of this even happened, you know, long before any of this actually happened. And, and it's like, no matter what, like, you know, somebody's going to, this guy has it written that he's going to die and that's, that's it for him. And this other guy has it written that he's not going to die here and he's just not going to die. Uh, and then he'll another story, and this one just really blew my mind with, again, like the physics behind it. So um, I don't remember if it was his story or someone else's, but he was on like a joint patrol with the Iraqi soldiers, uh, and they were like walking through like a, a street, you know, like, li like lining the street, kind of walking down the street, and uh, some enemy folks started like shooting at them, and they all ran behind different things, going you know, taking cover or whatever, and there was one Iraqi soldier who was just in the worst place at the worst time you know just I guess what you would call kind of like bad luck uh, and uh, again we would call it like divine decree <laughs> and so this guy starts running and there's an enemy machine gunner who has like a bead on him he's shooting like directly at this guy and he's, ch he's trying to lead him meaning like he's shooting in front of his his path to hit him as he's a moving target right so the guy turns around and runs the other way. And then this machine gunner adjusts and tries to fire in front of him the other way. So again, he turns around and tries to run back the other way again. And, and in this run, he's like in a full sprint, trying to run behind like a barrier or something. And uh, this machine gunner hits him right in the neck. And this guy falls down, hits the ground. And then, uh, and again, you know, Star Sergeant Z thought like, oh man, this guy must be surely be dead, you know. But he got right back up and kept running again. Um, and there was like, wow, how would he live, you know? And after this firefight, they go back and look at this guy, and everyone's like, whoa, man. He has a bullet hole, like entry wound, exit wound in, in his, each side of his, like the thick of his neck, like the middle of his neck. Um, and everyone's looking at him like, how are you alive? And um, when they came back, like apparently, you know, it just went through his neck. It missed all of his arteries and veins. Uh, it missed his esophagus, his trachea, his, you know, spine. Uh, apparently, it, like, pushed his esophagus forward, and then it came back. And, um, and it just didn't hit anything, you know. Uh, and he was fine. And they just put a bandage on each side of his entry, on his entry wound and his exit wound. So he had two, like, banded, like bandages on each side of his neck. And, like, a couple weeks later, he was back out on patrol, and he was totally fine. And that, that story especially was, like, the one I was like, whoa. I was like, how is that possible? You know, I thought the kinematics behind it again, I'm just like, okay, so there's a guy, he's in a window or something, he's shooting down, he has like an RPK. And, um, and one thing about machine guns is they're designed that, you know, it's usually like an open bolt uh, system, an open bolt system. So like every time like the bolt moves forward, there's a pin that kind of automatically comes out and it, you know, hits the, the, uh, the primer and, you know, explodes the, thing and it goes out the barrel right and so every time the bolt hits the round 
um, it's slightly different each time. It's like a very, very microscopic, very tiny difference in each time in the way it hits the round. And the result is that each bullet will come out just slightly differently. And uh, the further the distance, the more this like spread grows, right? So if you're shooting 800 meters away, you're gonna have like a big cone of fire. Like it, it, the bullets kind of expand like a little bit in like a cone shape. Um, so I'm just thinking, okay, so he had guys a machine gun and he has an open bolt system probably. And, and, and so there's like these slight differences in the way that the bolt, bolt hits the round. The round goes out, he's aiming at this guy. Uh, this guy is in the middle of a run. Um, <clears throat> this bullet goes and hits him at a certain angle in his neck that it misses literally everything in his neck and goes out the other side and he's fine. <clears throat> like the slightest, I was like, what are the chances of that? One in a billion maybe, or a tr even a trillion? So like, like the slightest right or left from that machine gun or the slightest up or down could even totally miss his neck. Um, like this is like, uh, you know, not even like user, uh, a, a difference that like a user, you know, can, can, can change, you know, in terms of microscopic, like just tiny changes here. Um, and then, you know, and this bullet, like the way the bullet goes in the neck is like even like a centimeter of difference could have killed him. Uh, and I'm just thinking about that. Like, what are the chances of that? Like, this is almost like impossible, you know, that this guy survived a bullet to the neck. Um, just crazy. And then, uh, and then that ranger, another story, that other ranger I know, he told me another story that's kind of similar to this. Um, and he said one time, I think I may have asked him like <laughs> if he had any kind of stories where people miraculously survive things. And he was like, yeah, like one time he was in a firefight and in front of him was one of his, like one of his guys, I think he was a ranger, maybe he would have been a regular army soldier, I don't remember. I think he was a ranger. I mean, I think he was like a new guy though. And he was like, they were like shooting or whatever. I think it was Afghanistan. And, uh, and in front of him, like, this guy just takes a bullet, like, straight to the head, like, right between his eyes. And he just, just falls right down. And so he grabs him and pulls him down. And then he's, shoot he's standing on top of this, like, over the top of this guy. And he's shooting at the enemy. And then he looks down to check on this guy. And he's like, he must certainly be dead. He just took a bullet, like, through the head. Um, and the guy was blinking at him. And he was just like, Whoa he's still alive and then uh he's shooting or whatever and afterwards they found out like he took a bullet like perfectly through the middle of his of his of his brain and uh it so like the, the way the brain is shaped you know like uh, like through the middle of it like, i guess it just perfectly split through like the middle of his brain and um the only effect that it had was he went deaf uh and so he's like i don't know if he's still deaf he's probably still deaf now but he went deaf, uh, so the part of his brain that controls his hearing is, I guess, gone. Uh, but the rest of his brain is totally fine and intact. And again, you just think about the physics of that, like, you know, it's just so nearly impossible, right? Um, it's just amazing, you know, and, and I, I think about God, and it's like, again, like, this was just written for this dude, you know, um, uh, this kind of, like, you come to a point where science just kind of breaks down. Uh, you know, science has its limitations. I'm not in any way anti-science. You know, I love science. I have a degree in nutrition science. You know, I love reading research. Um, but uh, this comes to a point where this, uh, our ability to you know observe and calculate things and understand things, just kind of reaches its limitations, right? Like stories of the unseen, stories of just miraculous things, like people getting shot and living you know, in, like shot in amazing places and living, you know, this comes to a point where science just hits its limitations. And it's like, um, at that point, it's like, I mean, I just think like, wow, you know, how can there not be a God? You know, how can there not be a God at that point? You know, like there's no way that this is all just one giant miraculous universe, you know, just accidentally popped into existence one day, human beings, you know, or, you know, it's not like I've observed <clears throat> one day, like a, a bunch of, you know, uh, a, a bunch of like, you know, pro a bunch of like minerals just arrange themselves and turn into self-replicating DNA one day. And then like, there's like a water droplet, you know, 
that just pow just turned into a cell you know and, and that cell multiplied into a lizard you know like we've never observed anything like that you know it, it's, it's kind of hard to believe you know that that was just all a giant accident that all this is just there's so many accidents that are just like this isn't an accident you know there's there's no way this can't be an accident you know and so I see these types of things and I'm just like wow and I hear these stories and, 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 and you put it all together and it's like how can you know at the end of the day like there is a God and there's a reason we're here you know and then I look back at that dream I had and I put and I add that in there and it's like well I'm here to be tested like there's a reason I was put down here I have a soul there is a God there's a reason we're here um, what is that reason though you know uh, to me I, I, uh, the result is you know I started turning back to Christianity um, uh, but I'll get to that soon inshallah there's one more story uh, to tell uh, there was uh, another staff sergeant I have and he told us this story like right before I got out of the army actually like last week or two I was in the army I don't want to say his name uh, but he's a Latino gentleman um, and uh, he has a bit of an accent so I'm sure he immigrated here you know maybe a little bit older in his life and joined the army and uh, he was a staff sergeant at the time and uh, he told us a story that, you know, and I was kind of wondering too about him because he's a bit older. He's probably like in his 30s or 40s. Uh, and uh, he didn't, I don't think he's married. Like, you know, he he's has kind of a, like a strange life. It's like, well, what is he, you know, what's going on there? And he told us this story that perhaps, you know, like haunts him. Uh, he said that one day uh, when he was in Iraq, there was a kid who said, hey, you know, I'm not, there's a bunch of, like, weapons and stuff stored up in this, out in this field. And, like, and this kid offered to, like, show them, like, what these weapons are and everything. Like a weapons cache or cache or whatever. And they're like, okay. And so they go to this field, and they cordon the area off. So, like, around them is, like, it's kind of like a square-shaped field with a road around it. And so they drive out to Brad their, their Bradleys, their, like, vehicles and stuff, and surround it and kind of secure the area. And then, so then he, this staff sergeant, says, okay, i show me where it is, whatever. And so this kid starts walking through this field, and he's following him. I didn't realize at the time the kid was showing him a particular, like, kind of path, like, walkway through the field that the kid knew. And so he was just walking straight, but he didn't realize at the time, you know, like, what was really going on. So the kid uh, had took him through a minefield, but he didn't know that. And I guess the kid assumed that they knew it was a minefield, um, but they didn't know that. And so the staff trying to, as he's walking, he suddenly just steps on a mine, uh, but it doesn't go. But it doesn't go off. And so he's just standing there. And uh, all these things are running through his head, like, "Oh man, like, is this gonna blow up in a second? Is it gonna blow up? When I move my foot. Is it a dud? Like, you know, probably ten thousand things running through his head at the moment. You know, you could die. Like, this could be it. You know." <laughs> uh, and this kid turns around and he's like just bursts out laughing and uh and he makes you know comes to the worst conclusions ever in his head and he uh you know raised his weapon and he shot and murdered this kid and um and all of us around us he's telling us this story and there's like maybe four of us three four of us listening and we're like we all kind of just like lower our heads and then um i was like wait, so, like, why did you shoot him? And he said, I thought that I was going to die. At the, in the moment, in the heat of the moment, he's like, I thought I was going to die, and so I figured that he's coming with me. Uh, I was like, oh, okay, so, like, you thought he intentionally led you into a minefield at the moment. But looking back, um, the kid really was, trying, I guess, trying to do the right thing. And... Uh, and he laughed because, like, I mean, he just stepped in a mine and it didn't go off. You know, it is kind of funny. <laughs> like, he's walking through this, he's showing him through this minefield, and he's like a click, and he looks back, and he's just like, oh, <laughs> you know, oh man, what are the chances, you know? Uh, and the kid is, you know, nervous laugh or whatever, I don't know. Uh, and, then, you know, that's the, the fate of that kid, you know? Um, and then uh, he almost cried right at that point telling that story, you know? Um, I tell us by looking at him that he's spent a lot of time thinking about that, and it probably bothers him a lot. Um, 
And then uh, he was standing in this mine, and they were like, okay, well, don't move just in case it goes off. And they had to call in a robot. And so he's standing there for like four hours. And then this bomb robot comes out. As this bomb robot is driving up behind him, the robot hits a mine and explodes. And it blows into pieces. And then there's like a piece of the track hits him in the foot. And so he's still standing there, and they're like, okay, we got to get another robot. And then he's waiting. I, I'm not sure if they had to drive out another robot or if they already had one, but then they finally get another robot out there, and um, it checks the mine and stuff, and they're like, okay, you can move your foot. Like, this is a dud, and this isn't the type of mine that's going to go off if you move your foot. So he moves his foot, and it doesn't go off, and he's fine. And then now he has to live with that, you know. So, yeah. And these are some of the stories, you know, that I heard um, in the army. So a pretty important experience I had was with the Jordanian soldiers who came to our base. So there's on Fort Bliss, there's like a basic leadership course, which is a course for specialists who want to become sergeants. Um, and so it goes over like just basic stuff, you know. And then foreign soldiers also will come and attend to this. And so we had for like two months or something, some Jordanian soldiers come and visit us. And they also did some other training exercises with us and stuff. And uh, two of them had stayed in our barracks, just a few rooms down from me. And so I was like, well, great, you know. One day we went out to like, my friends and I went to some concert and I was like, okay, I'll go invite the Jordanian guy. I go and knock on like his door or whatever. And I was like, hey, you want to, uh, you know, come up to this concert with us or to go in like 15 minutes or whatever? The guy was like, oh my gosh. He's like, yes, yes. He's like, thank you, man. Thank you. I was like, he's like this guy, man. He's like, my roommate doesn't say anything to me. He doesn't talk to me at all, man. He just ignores me. And I was like, oh, really? I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, like, I don't know. It's whatever, you know. And um, this guy comes up. He has like, he puts his clothes on or whatever, and he comes out, and he has, like, this perfume, and he, like, hoses himself the perfume, you know. And he comes up to me, and he's like, you want some perfume? I was like, oh, yeah, sure. He, like, sprays a whole bunch on me, and I was like, wow, you guys, like, you guys love your perfumes, man. <laughs> uh, it smelled good, though. Uh, he was a really cool guy. And we go out in, uh, uh, to this concert or whatever, and um, him and I, were, you know, we talk about some basic stuff. I was like, so what's, like, Jordan like, man? You know, he's like, he's like well, I'm from, like, a, I don't know, some village or whatever. He's like, there's like a mountain there, and he's like, there's, not, there's like, there's nothing going on there, you know, man. He's like, it's not like here where there's like, you know, stuff like this going on, like concert, you know, like some like nightlife, or whatever. He's like, back there, man. He's like, it's kind of, it's just boring. It's kind of boring, man. You know, it's kind of simple and everything. I was like, all right. I was like, well, there must be some other cool stuff going on there, you know. Uh, especially after I read Weston Price's book, I was like, I'm sure there's some cool food or whatever, you know. I'm sure, there's plenty of nature to explore there, but um, he's like, yeah, it's all right, whatever. Um, and then like, uh, like he like walked around this area with me and there was like a water fountain and like some stuff. And he was like, Hey, can I take some pictures with you? And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, and we took like, some pictures together and, uh, I guess he wanted something to send back home, you know, his time in America, you know? And, um, uh, one thing that, that helped me with this guy though, is like, you know, it just helps kind of open my mind a bit. I was like, um, for one, you know, it's kind of disturbing to me how little uh, my f a lot of the soldiers interacted with these Jordanians. You know, it was kind of like, oh, like, those people are very different, you know, like, I'm not going to talk to them. Anytime I walked past them, though, like, um, I would try to, like, you know, uh, say what little Arabic I knew, like, you know, sabah al-khayr and stuff like that. And they'd be like, uh, like, ah, oh, nor And they'd, they really wanted to, like, hang out and talk, you know. <laughs> but, uh, N nobody really afforded them the opportunity, you know. And, uh, and then there's another guy in the barracks. He was a bit older, and so he obviously, you know, I think he was maybe slightly more religious and, you know, wasn't interested in, like, nightlife or anything. He's probably, probably married or something. Uh, and so I, one day I was talking to him, and I was, like, trying to ask him about, like, you know, Islam and stuff. And unfortunately, his English wasn't as good as the other guy. Uh, and I was like, what's the difference between a Sunni and Shia? And, like, why is there, like, all this stuff going on? He was, he tried to explain it, but, like, I didn't understand anything. <laughs> and it wasn't very detailed. And he was like, um, he, in the end, he just came down. He was like, he just couldn't form the words in English. And he was like, uh, it, it's very complicated, you know. And I was like, okay. Um, 
and I was like, what about like Israel and stuff? Like, do, do, like people like hate Israel or anything? Like, what's up with Israel? He was like, he's like, to be honest, man, he's like, Israel is like a blight on the Arab world, you know. Um, and I was like, okay, and uh, and he told me some basic stuff like, you know, to them, you know, it, it's it's kind of like an occupation of their land, you know. Um, and to us, you know, we have, a, I wouldn't say us, you know, there's a lot of different opinions in America about Israel, but um, at the time I was probably like more pro-Israel. Uh, and, and so like to me and to other people like me, you know, at the time, you know, Israel is like this, you know, some sort of like beacon of awesomeness, you know, sweet, awesome democracy or whatever in the Arab world. Um, and also uh, an excellent ally for the United States to project power in the region. Um, and so to him, it's just like, you know, it's just a point of contention. It's not, it's not really helpful to anybody. Uh, and I was like, okay, you know, and he gives like some kind of just, you know, like there's different perspectives on this and, you know, and you can't just assume that one perspective uh, is the only one that's acceptable, you know. Uh, people have different opinions and there's usually a, a pretty sound logic to that opinion, you know, if, if you take the time to learn about it. Um, I was like, okay, yeah. Uh, but one one unfortunate thing though is I really wanted to learn more about Islam, but he just uh, wasn't really able to explain much to me. Um, after all, I mean, Jordan is like like a hundred percent Muslim as a country, so he he doesn't exactly have a lot of interactions with uh, people who aren't Muslim, and so he probably wasn't really prepared. Uh, even if he spoke perfect English, he probably wasn't really prepared to you know explain like really detailed, intricate topics that I wanted that I was asking about um, uh, but I still had an interest in it and my experiences with these Jordanian soldiers you know it, it helped to open my mind a bit to uh, again overcoming things like racism and Islamophobia and you know these people are perfectly chill you know normal human beings um, and, and again if I put myself in their shoes it's like would I really be any different um, and then also when I was in Fort Polk, which is, I was helping to train another unit that was deploying, uh, I met some Afghan uh, interpreters, and they had, you know, I guess immigrated here, and they are probably just doing some extra work uh, uh, to earn some extra money for the military. And so, kind of interestingly, uh, these guys were uh, probably like the most religious people I'd met so far. Uh, they're super, they're really nice um, one of them, when I first saw him, he was kind of intimidating. He looked so intense, like really big beard, and like he wore like kind of like uh, old school, like American, uh, like like nineties, like you know those like green camouflage pants and stuff. Like he looked, he looked really hardcore for a second. But when he spoke to him, he was like super nice. Um, and uh, and then I, I spent some time sitting with another Afghan guy, and uh, he wrote some stuff on the on like a whiteboard. And it was like, here's some, you know, greetings and this and that and whatever. And he taught us a couple words in like Pash 2. I forgot like all of it. And um, interestingly, the greeting he told us, like the greeting in Afghanistan is assalamu alaikum. Uh, and uh, I was like, okay. And, and interestingly enough, though, like as we were walking around the base, we tried, you know, tried out some of these words and like, you know, he had like, like random, like American soldiers, like giving, you know, assalamu alaikum and like, wa alaikum assalam, like, using that on the base and on this like base and stuff it was kind of interesting but uh, this guy was uh this guy was kind of awesome as interpreter uh so i thought that was kind of kind of funny it's like you have like a bunch of american soldiers using the the salam but uh anyways uh another thing too again like he seemed very, he was very nice very normal um he talked about his son uh, i guess he had like a young young boy who was maybe like three years old or four. Um, we showed him like a card game and he was like, hmm, he's like, okay, okay. He's like, I think I'll teach this to my son later on <laughs> when I get back. We, like, we played like cards once and like, uh, uh, and then also I had the first, one of the first opportunities. I had a, I had a couple back in Iraq, but then we also had other opportunities to eat like the halal meals, um, which are by far way better than any of the military food like a, you know, ready to meal, ready to eat type of meals, MREs that we, that were for us, like American soldiers, uh, like these halal meals were like really awesome. Like you open that thing up and it's like, you know, um, 
like some lamb and like potatoes and stuff. It was like an actual like meal, and you're like, whoa, like this is really awesome, man. Um, and it had like other stuff in there, like uh, like some like salted like uh, soybean things, or whatever. Um, and so those things were like super awesome, man. So we were like, man, we wish we could get more halal meals. And those things, I remember in Iraq, we had a couple of those. And those things went so fast, like we were gone in like a couple of days because <laughs> everybody wanted them. Um, so that was actually my first experience eating halal food was eating those like prepared like halal meals, which, and granted we have those for the interpreters, um, but sometimes there's some extras, you know. And so these experiences with Jordanian soldiers, African interpreters, and then before that, the Iraqis, uh, it just helped to open up my mind because like finally I'm meeting Muslims and they're normal people you know uh like you think of them as you always imagine them as being like so different you know it's like a different planet or something like in reality when you actually like go and meet these people it's like no they they have a bit of like cultural differences but um in terms of like their day-to-day -day, like they're pretty normal people like they eat food you know they worry about their children they uh you know want a good education for their son you know they um have petty politics back home just like we do here you know they have you know, it's like they're pretty normal and pretty relatable, actually, if you sit down and, like, talk with them. Um, and one thing that kind of started to bother me was the, how little the American soldiers, my fellow American soldiers, like, wanted to interact with them. You know, they kind of, like, generally avoided them quite a bit. Um, the exception, though, was that Afghan interpreter, um, we had a good amount of time that we were all just kind of sitting in the same area. And we struck up quite a bit of conversation, and, and people were kind of interested in talking to him. And one more thing with that interpreter that was probably one of the most interesting things at the time, you know, that I learned was that he talked about nutrition at one point, and I'm like, oh, that's what I'm into now, you know, that's what I've been reading about. So there's another medic there, and he had like a knee pain um, from like some injury or something. And uh, this African guy was like, hey, uh, you know what we do in Afghanistan when we have like knee pain? And he was like, and he looked at, unfortunately, that guy looked at him very like, like, uh, uh, like, I don't care, but go ahead and tell me anyways, like, what, like, what am I about to hear, you know? <laughs> like, it was something I'm clearly not going to do, right? But I was like, oh, yeah, what, like, what do you do? I was like, I really wanted to hear it. And um, this African interpreter was like, uh, when we have, like, joint pain in Afghanistan, he's like, we eat animals' feet. He's like, we'll take, like, uh, and actually, this is that other inter interpreter, actually, sorry, who said this. But anyways, he was like, take animal's feet, but like, we'll put it in like a pressure cooker or something, and we'll, we'll cook like, you know, like, like goat feet or something like that, or like chicken feet or whatever. Um, and we'll eat that, and it has a lot of like, he's like, it has a lot of like nutrients, like, you know, like calcium and stuff like that, that are really good for the joints. And I was like, practically taking notes on my end. I was like, oh yeah, tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> this is awesome. Like, this is exactly what I want to hear about, you know. And, uh, and then unfortunately, the medic guy was just like, really <laughs> but I was like oh yeah yeah tell me more <laughs> and uh since then I have had the opportunity to try animal feet but I'll, I'll tell that later actually kind of after the little story one experience I had in the basic leadership course was an instructor who rebuked the term haji in the way that some of the people in the military use it um, so Haji is kind of like a derogatory term for like Iraqis and stuff and he said that you know Haji is actually a positive term you know it's somebody who has like made the pilgrimage to Mecca and so to them it's like so it's, it's something honorable um, and, and he learned that from you know talking with Iraqis and um, there's a comment made I guess almost like a rebuttal to anything positive uh, about you know Muslims <laughs> And it uh, was about like jihad or something, and um, he just didn't say anything. You know, uh, he didn't know the answer, and nobody else really did. If whether or not what was what was said was true or not, and he just didn't say anything. He just kind of continued on, and um, I actually respect that a lot. The fact that he just didn't say anything. You know, like if you don't know, then just don't speak. <laughs> you know, until you until you do know, until you can look it up and, and find out if, if if what was said was true. Um, it sounds like something very small, but like small things like that over time can help you to, you know, uncover those biases. 
Another thing was the overconfidence that I saw among some people, particularly among some my NCOs. Um, none of, some people were not at all like that, kind of arrogant, overconfident, but some people were, and it was very, it became very off-putting to me, especially as I grew as my, my, my time in the Army and I got a little bit older and a little bit more experienced. Um, you know, overconfidence can be very problematic, you know, especially from taking in reports and stuff during my time in Iraq uh, and, and writing reports about, you know, radio transmissions and things that are going on. And, and um, I'd always leave, you know, an element of uncertainty when I'm not entirely certain because people will see things. They'll be like, I heard two explosions, or I heard this, or I saw this. And um, I'll just write a report. Instead of saying two explosions happen here at this time, you know, blah, blah, blah. I would just say so-and-so reported that he heard this, you know, and that nuance is really significant, you know, until I know for sure, like, what happened. I'm not going to report like I know what happened. You know, I'm just going to report what I heard. So-and-so reported this, so-and-so reported that. Um, it helps become a lot more accurate in, in, your, in your recording of events and stuff. And um, I think that helped me a lot in general with the way I kind of see the world is, is just having that a little bit of um, uncertainty, right? And uh, I remember around, I think, 2013, I was at, we were at the range qualifying on our weapons, which you do at least like once a year or so. Um, and the score you can get is from 1 to 40. And so 40 is the best, depending on how many hits and misses you get. So you hit all your targets, you get 40. And uh, the top like category that you can get into is expert, and it's 36 to 40. I never actually got into that category. The best I had shot was a 35. And so for a moment, I was like, man, you know, maybe uh, I was, you know, we were practicing our weapons before we do it, and I was like, man, you know, I don't think I'm going to get an expert with the way I'm shooting right now. And I was like, I finally just had a moment of humility, and I was like, you know, maybe I should just go ask for help and, and for advice and tips, you know. So I just went up to some NCOs that were sitting around talking. I was like, hey, can you give me some advice? And, uh, and you know, they said some, you know, whatever, comments, this and that. And then one of them was like, you know, well, one thing you can do is uh, your butt stock is pretty short. And if you, if you pull it out of one or two clicks, it'll give you more leverage, you know, because your weapon is sort of like a leverage, uh, sort of like a lever, right? Uh, you know, the longer the lever is, the more leverage you have. So the longer your butt stock is, the more stability you'll have. Uh, stability, you know. Is a, is a big factor in your ability to shoot accurately. And so I was like, okay, I put, put out a click or two, I went back, and then uh, and I said, okay, we'll watch you and we'll see like, you know, how you do in this qualification and, and see if we find any more, you know, more errors in how you're shooting. And, and I shot and that was the first time I ever got an expert. I shot 39 out of 40. Um, and I was like, wow, you know, I was like, thank God, you know, I was like, just thank God for that. I was like, wow, it's the first time I ever, ever did, did, ever got expert. And as a result of that, I got to participate in uh, this event that the Germans hold every once in a while. Uh, so in Fort Bliss, there's some German soldiers stationed there, and they hold this thing called the Schutzenschnur, where you get to come and, and, you know, as American soldiers get to come and train with them and, and learn their weapon systems and stuff like that, learn, how, learn their G36 and fire it and, qual and qualify on it. It was all a very fun event. Um, and, uh, and I was like, wow, man, that was, that moment of humility, you know, really changed, changed me a lot, you know, and, and in order to grow and develop, um, that, that, that has to begin with humility. And that's something I learned there. Um, another thing that was a little bit off-putting to me about the military culture was the irreverence I saw among, you know, some people, not everyone. Um, this idea that you just can't take everything seriously, everything's a joke, you know, can't have any kind of serious discussion. Um, it's just like I do my job. I, you know, work just work and play. You know, I only want to learn my job as much as is necessary, and then after that, my life is just like just messing around endlessly. You know, playground attitude. You know, and, and that was just very off-putting to me. Um, and there's a number of other things uh, about the military to talk about, but these I feel like um, help me develop myself and also were some factors that led me to decide not to re-enlist. One of the most impactful experiences I had in my life and also in the Army was one night I 
this is about around 2013. So I'm nearing my end, the end of my time in the army. I, I wasn't planning on reenlisting. And one night, you know, I, I went to bed and I had seemed like a it was a Friday evening and it seemed like kind of a normal evening at first, but uh, something f just felt a little bit different. Um, and uh, as, I, as I went to bed. And uh, as I was getting ready for bed and stuff, I thought of a, a new soldier we had who'd been there for about a year. His name was uh, Zachary Otten. Um, I wasn't like really good friends with him, um, but we were definitely you know acquaintances and we talked a bit. Um, and we had some plans to go out and do things, but we, they just hadn't come to fruition yet. Um, and I, was, I started randomly thinking about him. Uh, and I was like, hmm, yeah, maybe I should go, you know, we should, you know, make those plans happen, maybe this weekend or next weekend, we'll, you know, go to whatever city and do whatever, you know, one day, and, uh, and I was like, yeah, maybe we'll, I'll talk to him tomorrow or something, and then, um, I kept thinking about him, it was very, uh, kind of odd even, and I was like, why am I keep thinking about him, um, uh, and uh, as I, especially I was laying in my bed, you know, I hadn't noticed anything different about him though. That was the thing. Um, again, I wasn't super good friends with him, so it's not like we were super interactive every day, you know. And we weren't, we didn't really work together directly. Uh, we just kind of did like some fitness together uh, as like the headquarters unit, and then we kind of all went our different directions. Um, and so the only the only thing I really knew about him was just during the fitness tests, really, uh, and and certain formations and whatever. Um, but I hadn't really noticed anything different about him. He seemed, you know, perfectly normal, healthy guy. I, I don't know. I wasn't updated on his day-to-day -day life happenings, you know. Um, and I was laying in bed, and uh, I kept thinking about him, and, and something just felt kind of off. Um, and uh, and I thought about it, and I was like, well, should I go check on him? And I thought, like, okay, well, let's see if there's any warning. Let's think through it. You know, have you seen any warning signs? And I was like, no, no, you must be... I don't see any more. I don't know of anything different about him. I just, for some reason, just keep thinking about him. And I was like, okay, well, maybe you're just randomly thinking about nothing for no reason, you know. Or, and I was like, okay. And I thought about it, and I was like, just to be sure, I'll just go. I'll go. I'll check out tomorrow and just see what's, you know, what's going on. I don't have any reason to think if there's any kind of emergency, you know. I think I saw him, like, earlier that day, and he seemed happy, smiling, normal. Um, and I was like, all right, you know. Um... And then as I was laying there, you know, again, it felt, something felt awesome. Something felt kind of uneasy, you know. And, uh, and then I had this weird experience. Uh, I was laying in my bed and like, I felt something move across me. Um, it was maybe a few feet in front of me, uh, like or a few feet above me, really. Uh, um, like two, three, maybe like three, two, three feet above me. And, uh, and it moved from my right to my left. And so to my left, is like a wall, and uh, I'm, my bed is up against a wall. On the other side of that wall is Zachary Otten's roommate. And the other side of his wall, one more room over, is, is Zachary Otten's room, his bedroom. And um, so I felt something like in the unseen world, you know, like some kind of just thing move past me, and it was like a, uh, it felt like kind of like when you, you're arm is next to like a, a static electricity type of like, like a door handle or something you know and uh and your the hair on your arm raises up and like touches this metal you know like it's like pointing towards the metal you know like the like static electricity uh, uh, near your skin and like raising your hair right like every I, but it was that like in a very amplified way you know like the, all the hair in my body kind of like almost like stood up and like and this thing is like, boom, like it just moved past me, and it was like, and I was like, whoa, and I was like, that's something I've never experienced before, um, and I was like, what was that? Was that like an angel or something? I don't know what just happened. I was like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm definitely like, first thing in the morning, I'm gonna go knock under the door and see what's going on. You know, um, I don't want to come in the middle, you know, 10 p.m. like bang on his door, like what's going on? You know, and I don't have any reason to. Other than like, again, I don't have any like physical, secular reason to check on him. Like it's just like things, it was just like a supernatural experience, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't want to seem weird. Um, bang on someone's door over like a supernatural experience, you know, you'll think I'm crazy or something, I don't know. Or, uh, 
and, or just kind of cheesy, you know, like nothing is going on. And I'm like, are you okay? You know, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to casually approach him tomorrow, knock on his door and be like, hey, you know, uh, do you want to go, you know, make some plans this weekend or whatever? And I'll see that like first thing in the morning. That was my plan. I was like, man, it's like, again, like I didn't have any other reason to think that he was like a, a suicide risk, like whatsoever. You know, I didn't see a single sign. Uh, uh, now the people who were closer to him maybe saw like a sign or two, um, but to them, uh, he also didn't seem like a, a high enough suicide risk, I guess. Um, but apparently there's a lot of things going on in his life, uh, that uh, I didn't know about until afterwards. Um, and that next morning we like, we found out, um, I think it might've been like a Thursday or Friday night. I don't remember exactly what night, but the like next morning, like we found out he had, uh, uh, uh like his friends had come to get him for uh, personal well, the physical training in the morning, and uh, he had committed suicide. Um, he had like some kind of like gas tank, and like he put a bag over his head, and like you know, um, just went to sleep and like didn't wake up, uh, type of thing. And um, <clears throat> apparently, he had like a suicide hotline card like on his desk next to him, but he never called it, and uh, he just made a decision and, and he committed suicide. Um, and I was like, uh, I, I was at the time I was like the, the arms room dude. And so I was in the arms room the next day and I didn't even know until like another guy had come up to me and was like, Hey, you know, uh, like don't freak out. But we just found out like Zachary, the, his name's Auden, that Auden had just committed suicide. And I was like, don't joke about that. It's not funny. And he was like, no, I'm serious. And I was like, Oh really? I was like, I just saw him like like yesterday though, and he seemed normal. He's like, yeah, I know. Like everybody's saying that, um, and I was like, whoa. And then uh, <clears throat> um, like I thought about uh, that supernatural experience I had, and I was like, um, like what's going on? You know, like uh, what was that? You know, um, like what happened? Was that like an angel that came to take his soul, or was that something else? Or you know, I don't know what that was at the time. Um, and since then, I've realized, actually, uh, as I've had that feeling one more time after that uh, a similar experience and feeling, it, it seems like that was a gin. Um, exactly what it was doing, I'm not really sure. Maybe it was trying to make sure that I didn't intervene. Uh, I don't know. I, you know, don't, no idea. But at the end of the day, that really, like, triggered something in me to search for God, you know, uh, at this point, you know, in my life, it just there's been so many people who just died around me, and there's so many events and just things, you know, that I've stories I've heard, and and, um, and people who, not necessarily I personally know super close near me, but people I know who are like dying and stuff at a very young age. I think he was like 19, um, and there's also since then between that time uh, and my time in ar- time joining the army. Um, I'd heard that there were like a couple, I think two or three suicides of actual friends I had from high school, um, from different things. Uh, one guy committed suicide, another one um, like accidentally shot himself in the leg or something like that. Uh, when there's like some perhaps drugs and alcohol involved, like uh, you know doing some perhaps naughty things, uh, and there's a gun involved and he accidentally got shot in the leg or something and people I know who I was friends with back in high school and then in the army there's all these other people and stories and things and people you know who, who died and so on and then and that one particularly uh really had me like just kind of like soul searching I was just like wow uh, it could happen you know you could die anytime you know he was not like 19 or something and he uh, maybe he was 20 uh and, uh and at that point I was just like man like and I thought about my own death especially um and apparently there's some research I've found. There's, uh, when I was studying at TCU, there was a guy who did some research into why people change their religions. And he said one reason is, uh, like one of, the, one of the most common reasons is people have like a near-death, exp- like some kind of an experience, rather. They have some kind of experience that reminds them of their own like mortality and reminds them of death. Um, and they go kind of soul-searching, you know. And, uh, and that's kind of what happened to me in a sense. Um, I was just, I started thinking about myself and I became very kind of remorseful um, and I was like what have I even done with my life I haven't actually done any I feel like I hadn't done any good deeds um, and I was like what if I die like will I go to heaven like I don't know 
uh, and I thought, you know, I got to do some good deeds, you know, just whatever you can do, you know, just find some good deeds to do. Um, and, uh, and I thought about that and I was like, God, I wish that night today that, that I had like, you know, I, wish, I wish that, that night, sorry, I wish that night that I had like gone and like, you know, got up and intervened, you know, and, um, odd, you know, very odd experience I should have. And, and, and one problem too is like, again, you, especially growing up in Minnesota, like a liberal state like that, you know, you grew up so secular um, you're just ingrained with this secularism. Oh, ghosts aren't real. Spirits aren't real. There's no soul. You're, you know, um, and granted, it's Christianity and stuff like that. But it's like the separation between you know church and state. The the this like atheistic, you know, Enlightenment era, like 17th century, you know, like 18th century war on religion. You know, um, it takes you know it takes such a toll on on uh, on you that you you have this idea that you just like. Religion is all personal, and you know, it's like a hobby. You know, it's like some dude likes working on his Mustang on the weekends, like, you know, and this other guy likes going to church. Like, it's, you just keep it to yourself. You know, um, it's like you grew up so uh, uh, an in, intensely secularized. You know, that you keep your religion to yourself, and you, you know, spirituality is fake, and there's no no such thing as ghosts. You know, and yada yada. Um, that like the idea of actually acting upon something from the unseen uh was just like unfathomable to me and after that i was just like wow you know uh i mean just like what next you know i, I don't know uh i gotta i, I, I felt like i was so remorseful and, and and like i need to do some good deeds and and like you know go, come back to god and repent and start going to church again and and, and go to god like i feel like i needed to go to god that's all that's all that i really knew uh that's one thing that, it's one thing a lot of the um, sheikhs of Tessal have talked about is, is the, your irada, is your will to go to God, right? But uh, that's perhaps a discussion for another time. Um, and so after, uh, like that weekend or something, and sorry, I miss, I, I don't remember the weekdays that well. I think that might have been like some some work, you know, two work days was when that, that, that happened. And then, then came the weekend, you know. Uh, so that weekend, I remember driving around in my car around El Paso, and I was just like praying to God and just thinking about this. And like, I went to like a church on that that Sunday, and I was just like, and they talked about someone else who had died <laughs> that Sunday from their church. And like, I, I didn't you know, you know, I didn't really know what church to go to or anything. I just picked a random church, and I was like, I just got to go to church, you know. And um, and then I was like, just thinking about you know. Uh, Zachary Otten, I was just like, man, I wish I had done something, and uh, um, I felt so remorseful again, I even started, like, slightly crying a little bit, uh, and I guess people assumed that I knew the guy in the church, and I was like, I actually don't, yeah, I didn't talk to anybody, I was like, I actually don't know this guy, sorry, but um, it's just like, man, and then I remember driving in my car around El Paso, and I was like, I just need to pray, I need to do something, uh, uh, and I went and I gave blood, and uh, I barely even, like, had, like, the I got kind of, I guess I got kind of lean at that point, and apparently, um, I've been eating kind of vegetarian for a little while before that, so I guess my blood iron wasn't very high, and, um, and I barely passed the threshold to donate blood, and I was like, yes, <laughs> so I donated blood for the first time in my life, and I was like, man, like, what can I do, what can I do, um, and then I, uh, I remember I was, like, driving around, and I was like, maybe I should help a homeless person, I don't know, and, um, and then, uh, uh, like, I was like, I, I should just pray to God, ask him, like, God, is guide me to do whatever, you know, you want is best, you know, guide me to help somebody. Um, and I, at that moment, I thought, I was like, okay, I'm going to pray. I haven't prayed in a while. I was like, what do I, what do I who do I pray to? Should I pray to God or should I pray to Jesus? I remember reading some, um, I don't know if it was the Bible, because I'd, I'd read the Bible in, in total kind of recently before that, but the New Testament, rather, sorry. And I thought about it, and I was like, well, I thought about the ranks. I guess, like, my, my time in the Army made me think about it at this point, about the ranks in the Army. Like, okay, so I, I thought about, I remember a passage in the New Testament where Jesus had prayed to God. Like, he, like, he threw, he, he like, um, he put it, I can't remember exactly what it says. Like, he put his face in the ground or something, and he prayed to God, or he threw himself in the ground and prayed to God. And um, I just remembered that passage, and I was like, well, if Jesus prayed to God, um, 
why would I just pray directly to God, you know, to go up to the highest chain of command here, right? Like, why would I, like, if I have access to that highest chain of command, why would I go through someone else, right? Um, uh, it's just going to take, you know, in the army, that's just, I mean, is this going to take longer, right? For that per And that person may not prop fully tell the higher ranking person what you wanted to tell them, you know? Um, and, uh, and so I was like, I'm going to pray directly to God, then that yeah, makes most sense. And I prayed to God, and I, and I was like, you know, guide me to help whoever I can, you know, um, or something like that. And I took my car, and I drove around, and I just kind of, like, just felt like, just drove wherever felt natural. And, like, I was like, I looked around, and I, like, turned right. And as I was driving, I drove over this bridge. I was driving places I'd never even been in El Paso before. I was like, I don't know where I am. And then uh, I, got, I, got turned, I remember I drove under, like, a bridge. I turned right, then I went kind of like left or whatever and I went over like a small bridge and then I was like kind of near like a train yard and then I saw like these um like four like homeless looking people and um and they looked really worried and I like rolled my window down and I was like hey do you guys like want to ride or anything and they're like at first one, one of them was like uh no nah. and the other dude was I guess kind of like their lead like a kind of like the leader personality I guess looks at me uh, and uh, he was like yeah <laughs> he's like yeah yeah of course yeah and then uh, I was like alright yeah get in or whatever and um it dudes like these four dudes jump in or whatever and uh I think it was three guys and a girl actually um like they jump in and then um and I was like alright like where you where you want to go they're like um pretty much anywhere but here right now <laughs> and I was like alright um so I'm like I just drove back over the other way over the bridge back where I kind of came from and I was like just driving and like I was like you guys want something to eat or anything you know and they were like um you know we we're kind of DTing right now but uh, I guess I could get something and um interestingly enough though like those people had like just jumped off a train like you know illegally riding the train and um and they were like man they're like you know you just <laughs> like there's we thought we were all about to get arrested right there I was like oh really he's like yeah he's like man we jumped off that train in the in the and there's like a police officer, I guess, who like, um, you know, tries to catch people like that. And they call him the bull. And they're like, man, that bull must be so confused right now. <laughs> I was like, uh, I was like, yeah, he's like, man, he's like, he's like, we were just about to get arrested, man. You know, like, he's like, you just drove up and saved us like right there, dude. I was like, really? They're like, yeah, man. He's like, like that bull saw us get off that train. And he had us like, like there's one on the other side of the street and the other on the other side of the street. Like we had nowhere to go. If you hadn't picked us up, then we would have got arrested. I was like, I was like, whoa! I was like, well, all right, man. <laughs> you know, I hung out with them for that day and stuff, and like, um, and they, they were pretty cool, uh, uh, interesting personalities. And uh, one dude was like, oh yeah, I thought I would join the army, but then I was like, I decided not to. I was like, yeah, it's whatever. You know, people have different jobs. It's not a big deal, you know. Um, uh, people have different, you know, paths, whatever. And it's the army ain't for everybody. Um, yeah, so that was kind of an interesting uh, experience there. And then uh, uh, after that, I, was, I just like, man, I felt a little bit better. And um, <clears throat> as I was nearing my time to get out of the army, I became more, you know, just more interested in God and, and reading the Bible and, and, and thinking about my own mortality and stuff like that. And <clears throat> I chilled out a little bit more as the months went on, and, and I... Uh, I uh, started talking to our uh, chaplain's assistant, and he, you know, he was a very helpful guy. And I, I remember I got kind of stuck on a question. I was like, you know, I remember for a little while I was an atheist in high school, and I was talking to him. I was like, I remember though, I, I disbelieve in God and like the whole Holy Trinity. I was like, I disbelieved in all of it when I was an atheist, man. And he was, I was like, so how can I go to heaven if it says in the Bible that anybody who you know, disbelieves in the whole, blasphemes the Holy Spirit? Um, like when I really came to heaven and he was like but that's not what God wants though he's like it's not the point you know <laughs> you're kind of missing the point here uh, he's like um, basically as you're trying to tell me that so you can still repent from this but uh, for me though yeah that this whole experience is what is what probably got me most interested in religion again and, and really sparked that uh, interest in God again and, and the thing about it is when it comes to Christianity uh, to me, it was like a vessel, you know, of, of a religion. Like, a religion was like a vessel. And Christianity was the only religion I knew or was exposed to. 
Um, and, and to me, it was all about just God, worshiping God and, 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 and stuff like that. Uh, and Christianity was the only vessel I knew to get to God. Uh, and, but I was still open, I, I was decently open-minded enough about other possibilities as well. I, at the end of the day, I just wanted to go to God. Like, God is what's supremely important here. Um, uh, the vessel isn't necessary. I wasn't necessarily like dogmatic about the vessel. You know, uh, God is what was important.